Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2013 McDowell Lecture. Now, Professor McDowell, RJS McDowell, or Mac, was one of my predecessors as head of the Department of Physiology. He was head of department for about 36 years, which I am not intending to emulate. <laughs> he was born in 1892, and he was Halliburton Professor and Head of Department until 1959. And he was an Emeritus Professor uh, here until basically 1990 when he died in his 98th year. He worked in circulatory research and also later in asthma and allergy. And he wrote or edited the Handbook of Physiology, which is really one of the main texts and over the first part of the last century, he was in many ways instrumental in making the teaching of medicine a lot more scientific, the preclinical side of medicine. So we owe a lot to him. He actually endowed the college both with the small silver model of Reggie, the college's mascot, which is used in ceremonial occasions, a prize for undergraduate students, and indeed also uh, the funds which allow us to have these lectures every year. I'm delighted this year that members of the family are here with us today, the Dow family, for the first time for many years. And uh, thank you very much for joining us, Janet. One of his daughters, who also trained at King's in medicine. So there's a nice continuity there. Now, I'm particularly keen also, happy also, to be able to introduce the speaker, Gareth Lang, who basically is uh, head of the School of Biomedical Sciences in Edinburgh within the College of Medicine and Veterinary Science. Now, Gareth has, uh, interestingly, his first degree was a first class honours in mathematics. So that tells us something that our previous head of school was trying to get us to do more mathematics. And got a PhD in physiology in the University of Birmingham, and then went to the Babraham Unit Institute. And then took over the chair of experimental physiology at Edinburgh, and as I say, is now head of the bioscience Institute. He has an enormous number of publications in the field, and I'm delighted that he is accepted to deliver this year's McDowell Lecture. Thank you, Gary. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here and a great pleasure to be back here. Um, this is my first slide. I, I put that up well in advance. And the first time that I used this cartoon to introduce a talk was a couple of years back when I gave a talk at Geneva Farm. Um, I, I, I wasn't to know that, that that talk was going to be introduced by Sidney Brenner. Um, and I certainly wasn't to know that Sidney Brenner, since the time that I'd seen him previously, had grown a beard. So, <laughs> so he, he didn't speak to me afterwards, but anyway. Um, of course, I, I was interested to uh, refresh my memory about um, uh, McDowell's contributions. Of course, he came from Ed Edinburgh. Um, I just mentioned that. I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, I, I like this. This is the first paper that, that I can find uh, that he, he, his first contribution to the literature. And it's notable for a number of things. Um, it wasn't extravagantly referenced. In fact, the only reference in it was to Exodus. <clears throat> I think that, that's kind of a, a message for us. Our, our young PhD students, they often use references far too liberally, I think. Um, but he was a very interesting character. And, and he, he wrote on diverse themes. And this is one that I particularly uh, liked. I think it shows his character. He wrote on the physiology of monotony. And I've highlighted the, the section that I really caught my, my imagination here, where he, he was really musing on the difficulty of studying monotony. And he kind of pointed out that as a cardiac physiologist, there's a big problem with, with measuring blood pressure because that would just destroy the monotonous nature of the task. Um, and he also, I think, again, has kind of particularly uh, noted, as far as my own interests are concerned, uh, 
<laughs> it's kind of remarkable. He, he clearly had this kind of lovely prose style in his writing. Uh, but but uh, here he is, this, this is his introductory sentence to this chapter. I'm still wondering why I was asked to introduce this course. And uh, within a few sentences, he said, I feel that in the near future, the science of dietetics, which has already become a musical joke, will become dis discredited through the advent of non-medical dietitians. How prescient he was. And here I've just, just highlighted a bit of one of Ben Goldacre's writings just a couple of years back, making exactly this point, uh, 80 years on, of how our science has been corrupted by uh, really non-scientific people that distort what we do. Uh, and this, of course, is, is a particular concern to me, because the distortion uh, of, of our science, and I work on oxytocin, as you'll hear, uh, the distortion of our understanding of that by science that I can only politely describe as nonsense uh, is, is, is prevalent today. Anyway, going to begin. I mean, you, you, I'm a physiologist, and this is the kind of prevailing dogma of the brain, that neurons, the brain really consists of billions of neurons that communicate by this fast transmission, the only thing that's important is neurotransmitters. And that if you imagine the brain consists of 10 billion neurons, each of which has 10,000 synapses, and these neurons are firing at 200 a second, then clearly this explains everything. <clears throat> um, the problem is it doesn't really explain anything terribly interesting. Uh, and so uh, I, I work on the hypothalamus. I'm a physiologist, and the hypothalamus doesn't do clever. When people think of the brain, they usually imagine that the brain's about thinking, about complex things. I don't know there's much evidence for that, but I do know that there's evidence that the brain does a lot of things that are terribly important. And there's nowhere like the hypothalamus for doing important. And the hypothalamus, I like this, this slide, of course the hypothalamus is about behaviors, it's about instincts. It's the hypothalamus that controls all aspects of sex and reproduction, from sexual behavior, right through to pregnancy, parturition, through to maternal behavior. I'm going to touch on some of those things. And I like this slide. Of course, you know this, no, no, this is a famous picture. But I like it because I'm a physiologist. If you look at that photograph through the eyes of a physiologist, and what do you see? And what I see as a physiologist is this is a classic lordosis reflex. If you look at the woman, head thrown back, the arched back, the raised buttocks, a classic lordosis reflex know from our experimental animals. And it's a reflex that is controlled by a peptide released in the brain, not a neurotransmitter, a peptide, and that peptide's oxytocin. The hypothalamus doesn't only do sex, of course. It does, does many things. If we look at this, this is a very beautiful image of the kiss, but it's not erotic at all. This isn't really about sexual behavior. This is about sexual dimorphism. The contrasting body shapes of the male and, and the female. And of course, sexual dimorphism is very much what the hypothalamus does. And the sexual dimorphic patterns of regulation of the gonads is, is, derives from the sexual dimorphism of the hypothalamus itself. And of course, the hypothalamus is about circadian rhythms. It's about this, the, the, this drive that is so important to our health, this alternation between uh, the subjective day and the subjective night that drives these bodily rhythms that get us up in the morning. And we know that these rhythms that are governed also by the hypothalamus, by a part called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, are of key importance to our health. In fact, the risk of stroke or heart disease varies with the time of day according to the circadian rhythms that are driven from the hypothalamus. And it controls growth. And one of the questions that I've asked in the past is, why do we need a brain, a supercomputer, to control growth? I mean, tomatoes grow, don't they? But they, they don't have a brain, as far as I know. But we need growth. And actually, the reason we need growth, a, a brain to control growth, is something that I will touch on and come to. Uh, but we actually, to put it briefly, we need a brain to control growth because the hormone, that, the growth hormone that regulates growth, it doesn't just come out. It has to be released in pulses. And actually, the, the hypothalamus is the generator of these pulses that are so important for our growth. 
And of course, hypothalamus is involved in appetite and is now thought, understood to be the key site, which is the origin of the greatest health problem that's confronting us now. that follow from that. And exactly how many of us now believe that obesity is essentially a disease of the hypothalamus itself. And stress. How can you talk about the hypothalamus without talking about stress? The hypothalamus is the head ganglion of the stress axis through its control of ACTH release. <coughs> but this is what is close to, to my heart, I guess which is the regulation of lactation and maternal behavior. And this is just a kind of important point. The hypothalamus is complex and ancient. And that means that, in fact, there's very tight evolutionary conservation in these systems in the hypothalamus, really across not just all, all mammals, but in fact across all, all vertebrates. And that means that our insights from the study of experimental animals can be translated faithfully into understanding of the human condition. And that's really very, very important for us when we think about animal experiments. We need to know and we need to understand that this is, in fact, a good model for the human condition. Now, none of these things that I've mentioned we normally think of in the context of neurotransmitters. All Release, peptides released within the brain and peptides released from the brain that affect the pituitary gland. And now we know that peptides in the brain are ubiquitous. Some people believe that every neuron in the brain releases not just a conventional neurotransmitter but also a peptide. And we now know of more than 100 peptides that are expressed in the brain. These are packaged within small subpopulations of neurons. They're not ubiquitously expressed, but there's a mosaic of peptidergic neurons throughout the brain. Now, neurotransmitters do dull things. They excite and they inhibit. Peptides do interesting things. They organize. They've got long-term effects on gene expression. And they've got striking effects on behavior. And if we're serious as physiologists and serious about as, as, as uh, neuroscientists, this is a challenge to us. Here's our brain, this massive supercomputer, 10 billion neurons, 10,000 synapses to each neuron. We think of information processing, as I sketched out at the beginning, as though it's all about a whispered secret, me to you, me to you. Given this anatomical specificity by the synapse, given the temporal action potentials and the rapidity of transmitter release. And so how is it, how is it that if you just inject a small amount of a peptide into the brain, crudely without any anatomical precision, just flood the brain with a peptide, without any temporal sophistication, you can get, as a result, what looks like coherent behaviors. Instead of some kind of nonsense, some messing up, it's not like sticking a screwdriver in the back of a computer, what you get with infusion of neuropeptide Y, for instance, is the animals start to eat. Give another peptide, our friends say, stop eating. Give another peptide. In other words, you get very specific, coherent effects from this crude administration. We have to understand how this is possible and the challenge that that presents to this understanding of the brain that I began with. Well, I, this is where I start. And this is the, the system that I've worked on for 40 years or so. Neurons are the oxytocin and vasopressin neurons of the hypothalamus. Uh, the oxytocin neurons are there in red, and the vasopressin neurons are there in green. Now, as I said, these, these, this is where peptides in the brain started. Uh, there was a time when really these are the only peptides we could see in the brain. Now we know that the whole brain is filled with a mosaic of different peptides and different packages of neurons. And all that space between these neurons is filled with little populations that do different things and contain different peptides. But we know more about these than about any of the others. And I'm going to trace, in part through the story, the story of, to some of those neurons, the oxytocin cells. Now, these oxytocin cells are very simple neurons. They're big, 
They call magnesiums. They just have a single axon. They don't project anywhere else in the brain. They, that axon goes to the posterior pituitary gland and really goes nowhere else. And there in the posterior pituitary gland, each cell gives rise to about 2,000 swellings and nerve endings from which this peptide is secreted into the bloodstream. And these are the endings from which that oxytocin, the vasopressin neurons are very similar, are secreted. And you can see in these endings the site of storage of the, the hormones oxytocin and vasopressin. They're packaged in large, dense core vesicles that are released by exocytosis. And in the posterior pituitary, there's a huge number of these, seven billion vesicles, and we know so much about this system. So this was the only pathogenic system we could study. And back in the 70s, it was the subject of some extraordinarily precise quantitative morphology. Add from that, we know that each of those vesicles contains about 85,000 molecules of oxytocin. And a rat, that comes to a microgram of oxytocin. Now, I'm a mathematician, as Jeremy said, and these are very big numbers, except for one. One's a very important number, and, and one's a number that's always worth remembering. That's the content of, of the pituitary gland. So, of course, these are interesting when we come, as I will come, to thinking about peptide release from synapses in the brain. Well, the classic thing that oxytocin does, and the one thing it's essential for, is the milk ejection reflex. Now, this is a painting that hangs here in the National Gallery by Tintoretto. It's called The Origin of the Milky Way. And again, I'd like you to look at this through the eyes of a physiologist. And what you see in this, if you look carefully, is that as the baby is sucking at one breast, milk is being let down at the other. In other words, that sucking at one breast doesn't result in a reflex that is local. It has to involve a systemic mediator. It is something that affects the whole body. And that thing that affects the whole body is the release of this hormone oxytocin from the posterior pituitary gland in response to sucking. Now we can see that reflex in the rat. Just briefly, it's actually hard to see in that. There it is. There are the young, suddenly straddling and stretching for food. And this stretch isn't something that was noticed straight off. In fact, it was only properly noticed about 30 years ago by a PhD student, John Wakefield, working in Bristol. I'll come back to that as to exactly why that was. But we now know and spinning on, that it's not just during suckling that oxytocin is released. It's also released during parturition. Now, here's parturition in a rat. Rats don't make as much fuss as women do. They have maybe 12, 12 young, and then they just get back and get on with their lives. Um, now, each of those births in a rat is preceded, as we now know, from some lovely experiments done in Bristol by Summerlee, by the explosive discharge of these oxytocin cells in the hypothalamus. Now, let me sketch out exactly what they do. This here is, is these are recordings from conscious rats. And Arthur Summerlee caught the blood samples just after this, this burst of activity to see this rise in oxytocin. I can tell you that every oxytocin cell in the hypothalamus, every one of these magnesia oxytocin neurons, far an explosive burst of action potentials that only lasts about a second. Their action potentials just chatter away. They go... <laughs> tick, 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 tick. And then suddenly, they go... <laughs> with this massive burst of activity. It's all over in a second. And that's it. That's enough for a pulse of oxytocin to come out from the pituitary and cause that milk, that milk letdown or to cause birth here. Now... It doesn't stop there. 
Artuition is a time when things change in the brain. You probably, probably know that uh, women after they've given birth are not the same creatures as the women before they've given birth. And the same is certainly true of rats. I can illustrate that here. This, this rat is actually a pregnant rat. And she, this, these pups aren't hers. Into her cage have been introduced a litter of strange pups. And what does she do? Well, she responds in much the same way as most women do. When they're pregnant and confronted with small children, they will kind of sniff and then run away. They will hide. This is not something that they are really looking forward to, to experiencing. But what happens after parturition? What happens after parturition is quite different. Again, these, this now is a rat that's given birth, but these aren't her own pups. And what's she done? In her cage, she's built a, na a, a, a nest underneath her feeding tray, and that nest is, is, a, is, an, uh, is where she's deposited her own young, and she will go out, I'll just show that again, and collect any strange pups that she finds and gather them together and nurse them. So it's a very simple model of maternal behavior. And it's absolutely striking, because you only see it normally after birth, after, in fact, a cesarean, uh, after a normal birth, after a cesarean birth, they don't show this behavior at all. Now, what's interesting about this is that we know that this behavior in the rat is solely attributable to actions of oxytocin. And we know that because if you take a pregnant rat and give it oxytocin into the brain, then she will start to show this maternal behavior, this pup retrieving behavior. And conversely, if you take a pregnant rat that's, just, a rat that's just given birth, but give it an oxytocin antagonist into the brain, then you don't see any such maternal behavior. So this maternal behavior itself somehow is dependent upon the release within the brain of oxytocin. Now, some of you who are still awake might remember that I said that these oxytocin neurons only project to the pituitary. So oxytocin is released into the blood, what I didn't tell you, but I'm telling you now, is that oxytocin does not get back into the brain from the periphery. It doesn't get in through the nose, it doesn't get in through, through the blood. So where is it coming from? Finally, prompted by that knowledge that oxytocin has this key role in maternal behavior, came the speculation that oxytocin is also important in what we might call love, in bonding between sexual partners. Because we know that, ox that uh, sex, orgasm, is one of these things that can cause a massive act activation of oxytocin neurons. And we do know, in fact, from beautiful studies on the prairie vole and the montane vole in North America, that yes, in this species, we can say with confidence that the bonding that is formed is a consequence of oxytocin. Now, I'm not going to go into these experiments in, in detail. It's a great story. I haven't got time here now, but let me tell you about these animals briefly. This is a photograph of two prairie voles in the cage. And the montane voles are very closely related species. So closely related, it's difficult to tell, tell the difference on sight. In fact, this, in this cage, there are also two montane voles, but they're as far away from each other as they can be. The other one's at the op other opposite end of the, of the cage. So these two species have got very different social behaviors. The prairie vole naturally cuddles up to each other. In fact, you can just assay the difference between the species just by spending the time they spend side by side. But what is interesting is that the prairie vole is one of the very few mammalian species which is strictly monogamous. When they mate, they bond for life. Now, mating in a prairie vole is a fairly spectacular event, when they mate, they, they uh, have uh, an interesting experience of 36, 48 hours of pretty well continuous copulation. So maybe it's not terribly surprising that something goes on in their brain after that. And what goes on after that is they form a lifelong bond for their partner. The montane vole, so similar in so many ways, is a uh, love them and leave them animal, uh, a typical kind of macho male. They're antisocial, minimally parental, and completely promiscuous, like most mammalian species, in fact. Now, what's interesting is, of course, that if you look at the brains and 
and ask what is really different about the brains of the prairie vole and the montane vole, one of the striking things is in the distribution of oxytocin receptors in the brain. And what we know, in fact, that these bonds that are formed by mating in the prairie vole are the consequence of oxytocin released within the brain during that first period of mating. And how do we know that? We know that because if you take a prairie vole, allow them to mate, but then inject an oxytocin antagonist, then no bond is formed. And conversely, if you take a pair of prairie voles, introduce them together, but don't allow them to mate, but give an injection of oxytocin into the brain of the female, then she will act as though a permanent bond has been formed. And there are robust ways of measuring those bonds that you can ask Jeremy about later. Back to where we started, this milk ejection reflex. And there it is now in an anesthetized rat. This uh, in this type of rat, it's unmistakable. Right? They're, they're not moving around, so you can see very clearly what is, what is going on. And it was John Wakeley in Bristol that first saw this. John Wakeley, PhD student, working in the lab of Dennis Lincoln in the 1970s. That's, this is the time at which electrophysiologists were starting to explore how the electrical activity of different populations of neurons in the brain was linked to behavior. And his PhD project was to record for first time from the oxytocin cells and to see how they respond to suckling. Now, if you think about it for a minute, you will realize just how typical a PhD project this was. If you think about it, you will realize that it is almost completely pointless, because what could he possibly find? I think we knew at that time that Record from the oxytocin cells during suckling, what could you possibly see? They're going to increase their activity. If they don't do that, then obviously something has gone wrong with your experiment. So it was pointless. It was pretty trivial. It was also a typical PhD project for another reason. And that reason was that his supervisor had not read the literature. Because if Dennis Lincoln had read the literature, he would have known that according to the literature of that time, then anesthesia blocks that reflex. And so the student was destined to see nothing. But it was revealing. Sometimes experiments that seem pointless and trivial are really worth doing. And in fact, the reason I'm mentioning it here is that this is an experiment that changed our understanding for the generation that followed. Because not for the first time, the literature was wrong. The milk ejection reflex works perfectly well under anesthesia. If you know what you're, and you've just got to know what you're looking for. And John Wakeley, was, while he was watching these pups suckling, he was recording the mammary pressure inside one of the mammary glands. And what he saw, and what he saw, he saw for the first time the behavior of these pups, that they didn't respond all the time, they responded intermittently with this occasional reflex. And he saw that just before each of those stretch reflexes of the pups, there was this spike in intramammary pressure, a spike that tells us that oxytocin during suckling is not released continuously. It is released discreetly, intermittently, in pulses. And that is really his key breakthrough. And so it, it, what, he fought, what he saw for the first time when he was recording from these oxytocin cells was these bursts of activity that I've talked about already, this explosive burst that just takes a second or so. Now. And then, once he'd seen one, every five minutes or so, you could see the same thing. Again, again, highly stereotyped bursting behavior. Now, this triggered a number of questions that sort of defined the field for the generation that followed. The first question is, why is it important that oxytocin should be released in pulses? It was a question that I hadn't thought about really before then, hadn't occurred to them. And the answer, in the end, is, is, is frighteningly simple. It is that if you expose a receptor or a cell or a tissue to continued levels of a hormone or a peptide, then typically what you see is desensitization. And to get a sustained biological response, 
Therefore, continuous exposure to a peptide just doesn't work. You've got to deliver it intermittently in pulses. And it was that insight that changed neuroendocrinology for the generation, because people realized that it's no good doing as people had done, taking single samples of a hormone and thinking that, that told you anything. You had to take samples frequently to understand the pattern at which hormones were released. And when people started doing that, they realized that virtually every hormone, when it matters, is released in pulses. And that gave this insight, this explanation of why we need a supercomputer to control growth hormone release. We need a pulse generator mechanism, and we need one for each of those hormonal systems. And that then threw into focus this second question of how are these pulse generators organized? What are the basic mechanisms involved in generating these pulses? And here you can see there are two things that you can think about. One is, you know, what is the mechanism by which generates these highly stereotyped bursts? And I'll talk a bit about those. But the second one is, what synchronizes them? Because all of these bursts, all of these cells, 9,000 oxytocin cells, they all burst together within a few hundred seconds. So something must be coordinating this reflex to enable them to all fire at the same time. Now this, I'm talking to you about this now, this is now a problem that we have now solved. I think we've now got a very good understanding of this. I'm not going to bore you with the details of that understanding, but uh, I can say that it is something that we understand well enough to build a computational model of this reflex. And our understanding, uh, and in this computational model, in the models that we've now developed, we have uh, up to 500 independent neurons that are mimicked that communicate with each other in a way that I will talk about. And the interesting thing is that within this model, they show these bursts, and the bursts arise spontaneously. And the bursts are indistinguishable in the model from the bursts that we see. I'm telling you this just to say that we've got a pretty complete understanding of this burst mechanism in these cells now. And I think that in I'm, I started out as a mathematician. And for me still, I think that mathematics is kind of so important because as physiologists, we must always ask ourselves, when do we really understand? When is an understanding good enough? And for, for me, an understanding is good enough when you can build a model that is indistinguishable from the real system. That is a test of the completeness of your understanding. But I'm going to talk about something that we had to find along the way that is maybe more important than this. So we know that when these cells generate these bursts, that electrical activity depolarizes these endings and causes these vesicles to fuse and this release of the hormone by what's called exocytosis. But you might think that for all these cells to be firing together, they ought to be communicating with each other in some way. To, to, if it is cells that talk to each other and excite each other, it's maybe got to be the kind of basis for this coordination of discharge. Now, this is the superoptic nucleus. It's one of the major sites of the oxytocin cells. And these are the oxytocin cells. Now, they, they're right at the base of the brain. You may not remember that, but they are next to the optic chiasm. So south of this picture is nothing. Well, it's, it's the rest of the body. I won't call the rest of the body nothing, but there's no other neural elements there. So what's this mass of fibers down here? Well, they obviously contain oxytocin. These cells are stained for oxytocin. Well, this mass, mass of fibers are dendrites. Now, these dendrites are themselves full of neurosecretory vesicles that contain oxytocin. So if they're all together at the base of the brain, maybe oxytocin coming out from these vesicles is what is the, me the mechanism by which one oxytocin cell communicates with another. And that's what we initially suspected. But I'm not going to go through the experiments, but what, just to say that if you try and stimulate these, then nothing very much happens. We couldn't get any oxytocin release from the dendrites by stimulating them. It seemed that electrical signals were not actually able to cause oxytocin release from these dendrites. 
And yet, and yet, at the same time, we knew from love experiments done in France that clearly oxytocin was released within the brain, was somehow central to understanding this, ref this reflex. Because what she showed was that injections of tiny amounts of oxytocin into the ventricles, just a nanogram, would dramatically facilitate this milk ejection reflex. It was a remarkable finding. This is just the injured mammary record, which she recorded from cells to show these re repeated intense bursts following ICV oxytocin. You only see this behavior in a lactating rat, and you only see it in the classic setting. So it seemed that oxytocin could do something kind of remarkable and what she went on to show, that this isn't just pharmacology, there are probably some pharmacologists in the audience, and I apologize for my disrespect, this isn't just pharmacology, because tiny oxytocin antagonist will completely block the reflex. And even a tiny amount of the antagonist given into just one supraoptic nucleus is enough to block the reflex. Now that, to me, is physiology. So that really told us Yes, it has to be oxytocin released within the supraoptic nucleus that is somehow central to the coordination of this extraordinary and evocative reflex. And so with Mike Ludwig, we, we spent a long time really trying to understand that oxytocin release from those dendrites in the supraoptic nucleus. And the way we went about it in the rat was to use microdialysis, because these dendrites form this mat at the base of the brain, if you expose the ventral surface of the brain, you can put a probe directly on these dendrites and pick up and measure what is released from them. And so we can measure these, and at the same time, using the same technique in the blood, measure release into the blood. And what's pretty obvious in a range of stimuli is that yes, oxytocin can be released from these dendrites, but it's not released at the same time as released from the blood. So it's not the, now we know that release into the blood is governed by electrical activity. And so what's governing release from these dendrites? And the breakthrough came with this paper in Nature that this is my Mike Ludwig, is the lead author on that, when he saw that, in fact, if you expose the, the oxytocin cells to oxytocin, then you get a mobilization of intracellular calcium stores from those neurons and a mobilization that spreads into the dendrites. So now he saw some, what he saw was that in itself is interesting but not exciting. What he saw, I think, was truly exciting. In schematic forms, what he saw is this. If you expose a dendrite to oxytocin or to some other factors, then you get this mobilization of intracellular calcium. Now, as a result of that, what you get is something remarkable. What you get is a migration of the neurosecretory granules from the center of the dendrite to the periphery. You do get some release directly. But now, in this site, when, once they're in this perimembrane location, now they can be released in response to electrical activity. In other words, the vesicles have got to be close to the plasma membrane in order for electrical activity to cause enough of a calcium rise through the opening of calcium channels to trigger release from them. And in fact, that this is, these are the electron microscopic uh, uh, studies of John Morris that captured this process beautifully with a technique called tannic acid perfusion. So I'll go through it slowly because this, this I think is so important. It's not an explanation of behavior, but what I would say is it's kind of a shape of a possible explanation of how peptides can affect behavior. So what we now know for the dendrites of oxytocin cells is they're full of, of oxytocin in granules, but these granules normally are not really releasable in response to electrical activity. Electrical activity typically is propagated down the axons, cause release into the blood, but doesn't do much here. What we know is that in response to a number of peptides, including two that I mentioned, including oxytocin itself, including another one that I'll come to called alpha-MSH, those some peptides can cause direct release from the dendrites, but more importantly, 
they can cause what we call priming, which is the migration of some of these uh, vesicles into perimembrane locations. Once they're in this state, then now electrical activity can not only propagate to the pituitary and cause release into the blood, but they can also cause release from the dendrites. And so you can now get communication between the oxytocin cells, and now you've got a positive feedback mechanism. In this state, the electrical activity of the cells will cause oxytocin to be released from the dendrites, which will excite their neighbors, and this is the key event that underlies the milk ejection reflex. And that's the key event that's modeled in our model. So, as a general statement, this mechanism of priming, first thing I'll say about priming is that priming is very long-lasting. Following exposure to a peptide, you can prime these stores for at least 90 minutes. We haven't looked longer than that. So it's a long-term change in the dendrites. And it's a change that effectively changes the functional connectivity of neurons in the brain. In other words, it changes how these cells can talk to each other. And so the question that we're asking from this is, you know, suddenly we now have something that seems to form the skeleton of what might be an understanding of, ch of effects on behavior. In other words, long-lasting reprogramming of brain circuits, a long-lasting instruction that changes the way that cells communicate with each other. And so we have investigated that a number of ways. The way I've chosen to talk about is partly by, uh, because of, of the McDowell's interest in dietetics, because one of my own interests is, is in appetite and nutrition. And I'm going to talk about the link between alpha MSH and oxytocin. Alpha MSH is another of these peptides that's released from a population of neurons in the brain. It's actually a very important peptide. It's a very interesting peptide. It's the most potent satiety-inducing peptide that is known. It, is a, a, you know, it really switches off appetite. And for a long time, it was the lead target of pharmaceutical industry in looking for treatments for obesity. Now, that search, that track went horribly wrong. Well, not horribly wrong. It went wrong in an interesting way. Um, I think the... the uh, the story that I'd probably like to tell you about is, is it's, in a, it's in a review in, in pharmacology by Matt Headley. Matt Headley was a peptide researcher interested in alpha MSH and its agonists. Alpha MSH is your town. That's, that's where it gets its name from. And Matt Headley had this lovely idea that for a scientist that, you know, wouldn't it be nice if you had a pill that could give you a tan? You wouldn't have to go sunbathing. You wouldn't have to spend your time under that baking sun in the heat. You know, you, you could stay in the lab and you could, you could do all of the things on your computer and you'd never have to go outside. All you've got to do is take a pill and you get a nice tan. Isn't that a kind of dream scientist? And so he tried it on himself, as a good physiologist would. He got the dose wrong. He wasn't such a good physiologist because in, 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 in extrapolating from a mouse to a human dose, he got it wrong by an order of magnitude. And it's a fascinating editorial because he explains the consequence for himself. The consequences, firstly, were acute nausea. Certainly switched off appetite in an extreme way. He was lying on his bed vomiting all afternoon. But the other interesting thing that, that he reported was that he had an erection that lasted throughout this uh, all afternoon. And it, 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 as he explains it, when his wife changed the sick, sick bucket for the sort of fifth time, she looked down at him naked on the bed with this large erection. And, and, and as he describes it, she said, this is ridiculous. And as he describes it, he raised his hand weakly and said, I think we might be rich. Because actually, isn't, isn't, isn't this a kind of dream peptide? A peptide that you know, in one little pill will give you a tan, will, will uh, let you rediscover your sexual libido, and also make you slim, isn't it? Isn't that kind of a wonderful scenario. But of course, for developing actually a treatment for obesity, this is really bad news. And in fact, that, that really killed off uh, the, the, this alpha MSH as a target for anti-obesity. But nonetheless, that is evocative because when I first heard about this, I realized that, well, oxytocin actually does, has exactly the same spectrum of behavioral effects as, as alpha MSH. And in fact, these systems certainly do talk to each other. 
Here in the suprop nucleus, these are alpha MSH fibers from the arcuate nucleus where alpha MSH is made. And there they are. And these are the receptors, the MC4 receptors for alpha MSH in the suprop nucleus, in the oxytocin cells, abundantly. So do they, do they talk to each other? Oxytocin had not really been thought of in terms of an appetite-regulating peptide. But, in fact, independently and for a different reason, we had, been really been, had our attention drawn to this. We were looking at the time at the appetite-regulating circuits in the, in the hypothalamus. And we were trying to find a way of distinguishing between the cells in the hypothalamus that were important for hunger and those that were important for satiety. And the model that we were using was a really quite simple one. We, we, what we did was, was to uh, try and catch, look at the brains of hungry rats and compare them with the brains of rats that were satiated. And so what we did was we trained rats to expect food for just two hours a day for 10 days. And they'll cope with this. And then when, once they were trained to expect that food, they're just being fed. And every time the food came, they would gorge themselves on that food and then stop within the two hours because they were just completely full. And this then allows us to capture the brains when the rats are hungry, when they're eating, and when they're full. And the, the method that we chose to look at those brains was to look at an immediate early gene called CFOS. Now, CFOS is a very nice, convenient gene because it is expressed just when cells have been activated and it's only expressed transiently. So if you look at the normal brain, you find very little CFOS peptide in that brain. And when the rats are hungry, just before they're eating, you find very little FOS. But then, progressively, as they eat, you'll see this product of this immediate early gene come up and fill the cells that have been activated. Now, the cells that I'm showing you as being activated are cells in the suprooptic nucleus. So these are the oxytocin cells and the vasopressin cells. Now, it's not just those. You get activation in all of the expected areas that we knew are involved in appetite, like the arcuate, the lateral hypothalamus, the ventromedial hypothalamus. But this is a dramatic activation in the suprooptic nucleus. And doing the experiment in this way allows you to do something else that's interesting, the implications of which I'm not going to talk about completely, which is that you can do the experiments but actually not give them the food. They're expecting food, but you don't give them the food. And so now you're looking at the brains when they expect the food and didn't get it. And what happens, and what you see is that, is that most of these areas come up anyway. Most of these areas that are involved in feeding come up just on the expectation of food. The suprop nucleus is one of the rare exceptions. It truly is a satiety center. It is only activated when, food, when they actually eat, and it's only activated after they've eaten a significant amount. So, we had known that alpha MSH was this really important satiety peptide, it's a real target for treatments of obesity. And we'd, we'd known that in humans, that if its receptors mutated, you get obesity. But oxytocin is also a very potent inhibitor of appetite. And if you look at the brain, these are oxytocin receptors in the brain. And there is the ventromedial hypothalamus. And the ventromedial hypothalamus has been known for a long time as this important satiety center. It's one of these centers where if you're lesion, you get very, very fat. Now, certainly cells here in the ventromedial nucleus respond to oxytocin. This is recordings from single cells. But what's interesting is this is a site where there are no oxytocin fibers at all. It's almost completely devoid of oxytocin fibers. So it's a massive, very dense site of expression of receptors, but no innovation. And the receptors are clearly functional. So, our hypothesis is that alpha MSH active, acts on those oxytocin cells, and that oxytocin somehow gets back to the ventromedial hypothalamus, but that it doesn't need fibers, and it doesn't need synapses to get there. In other words, it's a true neurohormonal effect, an effect of oxytocin that is acting within the brain like a hormone, released from this mat of dendrites, 
penetrating distant brain sites. And we can look at this in a number of ways. We know that if you give MC4 agonists or alpha MSH into the brain, then you will activate CFOS expression in these cells. And there it is, the CFOS in oxytocin cells. Now, I said this activation of CFOS is a marker of electrical activation. I didn't, well, if I did, I was quite wrong. Because actually this is a system that showed us just how wrong we are. CFOS isn't an indicator of neuronal activation. Because actually, if you record from the electrical activity, even though our frame switch switches FOS on, it switches the electrical activity off. It doesn't just switch the electrical activity off, it switches release into the blood off. But what we do know, as Mike Ludwig showed, alpha MSH will mobilize calcium from intracellular stores in the oxytocin neurons, and as a result of that, induce release from the dendrites. Now, this is extraordinary. What it shows is that these oxytocin cells can release from their dendrites and from their terminals, but they can regulate the central release and peripheral release independently, because the mechanisms can be dissociated completely. So why? Our it switches off peripheral release. We know now how it does that, but I'm not going to talk about that, but it switches on central release. Why? Come back to this. We know that alpha MSH and oxytocin have got similar behavioral effects on sexual behavior, feeding, grooming, social behaviors. Can we put these into a single kind of context? Well, maybe we can. Think of us as animals, products of evolution. An animal that has evolved, two things are most important, survival and reproduction, feeding and sex. And these are things that are of key importance to us as, organ uh, as organisms, key important throughout evolution, but they're not things that normally we do at the same time. And in fact, we can show quite very clearly that there is an interference between these two drives. If you make rats hungry, even by just denying them a meal that they had expected, these aren't, aren't starved rats. They just weren't fed when they were expecting to be fed. They're hungry. And you then present a male that is just a little bit hungry with a receptive female, then actually they're rather slow to mate. But we can reverse that completely by ICV injection of a small amount of alpha MSH or of oxytocin, as it happens. So what I believe is that what we're looking at here is a system in the ventromedial hypothalamus where you've got reciprocal coordination of two important drives. These two they're not mutually compatible, so you switch one off when you want the other one to be active. In other words, while we thought we were looking for an alternation between hunger and satiety, what we were actually maybe looking at was an alternation between hunger and sex. And so quietly here, what I've given you is an explanation of, of why us men take women out for dinner first and have sex afterwards and never the other way around. <coughs> so in the last bit, just come back to this cartoon that I showed earlier of the peptidergic neuron in the brain. I was told you that virtually every neuron has got, expresses at least one other peptide. And this is often the cartoon that's seen and neuropeptides are talked about neurotransmitters. To talk of a neuropeptide as a neurotransmitter is, is I think, uh, to put it politely, a lie. If you actually look at the synapses, then these are the synaptic vesicles that contain conventional transmitter. Here's a peptide-containing vesicle. It's a typical profile of a synapse, I think. You find very few of these, very few, a tiny number compared with the number of synaptic vesicles, and you very seldom find images of them close to the synaptic site. So they are found in, in synapses, but not many. Where do you find them? The big difference between peptide-containing vesicles and synaptic vesicles is expressed in that name. Synaptic vesicles you find at synapses. They're targeted to the synapse. You don't find them anywhere else in the cell. The large, dense core vesicles that contain peptides typically you find throughout the cytoplasm of the cell. So you find the peptide everywhere in the cell. And what part of the cell is the largest in volume? Well, Actually, typically, and this is a typical factor for most neurons, 
dendrites, you might be surprised to hear, are more than 85% of the volume of a typical neuron. So generally, peptides are things that are most abundant in dendrites, not at synapses. One last thing I want to talk about, I'm not really going to talk about the vasopressin system a lot, except to say that we were also interested in the vasopressin cell, and in particular, we were interested in building models of the vasopressin cells that looked at the link between their electrical activity and secretion, and for this, we had to do a calculation. What we had to do to build this model how many vesicles are released from a nerve ending when an action potential comes down that axon? And we realized that this is a question that you could answer absolutely, completely, and rigorously for the vasopressin system because we know enough about it to answer it quantitatively and precisely. I've told you how many vesicles are there. That's a very big number. I remind you, I'm a mathematician, so you can take that for granted. That's a very big number. That's the number of vesicles in the pituitary gland, and that's how much each one contains. Now, if we know that, and we know a few other things, we know the plasma vasopressin concentration, we know the half-life of vasopressin in plasma, so we can work out the release rate, and we can work out the number of vesicles that are being released in different physiological states. We know how many endings there are, and we also know the electrical activity of the vasopressin cells in these states. And so we can do a simple calculation that is rock solid. And it doesn't involve any sophisticated maths. It doesn't involve any maths that requires anything. And I'm really very proud to have published a paper in, in the Journal of Physiology that used, was a solely theoretical paper that used mathematics no more complicated than a 14-year-old child could do from, liter from literature that was mostly 20 years old and yet come to what I thought was an extraordinary conclusion. You saw what those endings looked like, packed with vesicles. And actually, what we can conclude, that at any one of those, you need about 400 action potentials, on average, to get just one vesicle out. And yet that is enough to provide enough vasopressin in the circulation to do all the hormonal things that vasopressin as a hormonal need, needs to do. Now, that was surprising enough to me. But now think of the brain. Now think, there we are, that's the nerve ending in the pituitary gland, and you'd need 400 spikes to release on average just one of these vesicles from a typical nerve ending. What are you going to need to release one of those peptide vesicles from a synapse? There are hardly any vesicles there in the first place. So we did another calculation. In the hypothalamus, we know there are about 9,000 oxytocin cells. We know how much oxytocin there is, it's about 12 nanograms, about 11,000 vesicles per cell. We did a simple calculation. You can do it yourself. It's not hard. If just one vesicle is released every 100 seconds from each of those cells, then the release rate, that's the release rate, would be about 0.1 picogram per second. Now let's do the calculation for the half-life in the brain. Now we don't really know what the half-life pet does in the brain. They're normally thought of as being the order of minutes. 30 seconds is shorter than any half-life that we know of any peptide in the body. So let's guess its half-life is 30 seconds. What's the distribution volume? I'm guessing it's a microliter. A microliter is the volume of extracellular space in the entire hypothalamus. So if that's the release rate and that's the distribution, what's the concentration going to be? This is very simple maths. It's going to be more than 1,000 picograms per mil. That's 100 times higher than we know is an effective concentration in the periphery, and it's the same receptors. So what I'm saying is that these vesicles, peptide containing vesicles in the brain, to think of them as like neurotransmitters is just sheer nonsense. It's like comparing an atom bomb to a bullet. Peptide vesicle release in the brain is going to be very rare. It's going to be very sporadic. But the amount that's released, and remember it acts at receptors with nanomolar efficacy, it's going to be this peptide release in the brain is not like synaptic release. I think generally it's more like hormonal release. I'm going to stop here. I'm just going to leave you with this. this I've got to give my thanks to 
the team that have stayed with me for so long, Vicky Tobin has done the neuroanatomy that I've shown, Duncan McGregor, the modeling, John Menzies has led the work on appetite, Sling Kakin and the work on behavior, especially sexual behavior, Nancy Sabatia, the electrophysiology, and Mike Ludwig, long-term collaborator, who's really led on the dendritic secretion. And this here, this here is a picture of Bass Rock off Edinburgh. It's kind of a romantic picture, isn't it? It's absolutely beautiful. It's kind of white island there. I'm a physiologist. Yes, reductionism is fine and mechanism is fine, but sometimes you can get too close to things. Bass Rock is that beautiful color because it's home to a massive colony of seabirds. In fact, you get close to it and you realize it's covered in bird shit. Thank you very much. <laughs>